Hi everyone, I'm Susan Birch and welcome to another episode of the Health Detective Podcast. And tonight I'm really delighted to have as my guest Jane Bowen from South Africa. She is the Chief Operating Officer, I think I got that right, um, for the Noakes Foundation. Um, you can see from her little name tag, she's part of the Nutrition Network. and she works with um, Professor Tim Noakes and a whole lot of other very inspiring people to help bring change in our understanding of nutrition. And she is a co-author editor of um, a recently published book called The Science of Therapeutic Carbohydrate Restriction in Human Health. So tonight I would like to talk to her about that. And I'm just encouraging everyone who's listening that this may be a great podcast to share with your GPs because this book is really aimed at um, helping medical professionals and other nutrition professionals really understand um, carbohydrate restriction and the science behind it. And it's packed full of science. So Jane, welcome. It's such a delight to have you here tonight. Thank you thank you so much it's such an honor to join you I love the South African accent <laughs> we haven't got any rugby games up for um yeah oh. nothing on the go at the moment <laughs> <laughs> soon yeah we were we were in the middle of we were in the middle of some chess matches so <laughs> it was a lively conversation <laughs> interesting so, interesting times <laughs> so would you tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you're doing and, and what lies behind all of this? Absolutely. So yeah, I come from a, a marketing and market research background. Um, so I spent kind of my first 20 years of my career in, I started off in pharmaceutical marketing and research and worked for the biggest pharmaceutical company in South Africa at the time. Um, and spent my first couple of years of my career actually traveling into Africa launching pharmaceutical products into new markets. So spending time actually on the ground in Mozambique, in Kenya, in East Africa, um, in a lot of countries that I didn't know, doing research as to how to, on, you know, sort of on behalf of a drug company, how to actually take products into these territories, um, which informed and supported what I now call my ikigai, which is my choice in life to really, really look a little bit deeper um, at what's going on with human health and certainly with the way that drugs and ph pharmaceutical products are marketed and treated in the world. And then also just sort of beneath that, what's going on with human health. And it really came to the forefront for me later on. So sort of 10 years on when I had started to develop really worsening metabolic disease myself. And that was when I found my way to the Noakes Foundation to the work that we do. I've, I became, you know, true to your name, I had to become my own health detective as so many hundreds of thousands, millions of us have had to, to actually get to the bottom of the health crises that we're seeing in our own bodies um, and in the world everywhere around us. And it became, you know, it becomes so obvious that once one opens the Pandora's box and starts to understand metabolism better, that this is the most massive work. And it's become, of course, the work of mine and perhaps yours and many of you that are listening of our lifetimes is how to work in this environment, how to live in this world healthily with the incredible miscommunication, mismessaging and terrible food that we're receiving. Mm. Mm. And mm. yeah, it's, it's huge. And like you say, when you open that Pandora's box, you just wonder, how, oh, my goodness, how did I not know this? You know, my mm -hmm. own experience um, studying through Otago University, which is a, you know, credible, well-recognized university. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was doing my master's degree. I couldn't. I went to Australia to do some training in secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease and that was the first time that insulin was raised and the diabetes educator was talking about insulin and you know I've said this lots of times that it sometimes the light bulb does go off like a light bulb it was like oh my goodness me 
and yeah. you know I came home and you know that was back in the days we didn't have the internet or anything it was like writing to the university sending a check ordering the papers mm -hmm. um, but you can't unlearn you can't unsee what you've seen and I mean, it's really interesting that you've actually said the word insulin. And, you know, I think that is where we start. And certainly where this textbook begins is with that absolute underlying piece of information that insulin resistance is the likely to probable cause of the majority of non-communicable diseases and metabolic diseases that we're seeing in the world today. And it's like, it's taken me, honestly, even though I knew I was insulin resistant very early on, I had a very progressive gynae that when I was 21 told me I had insulin resistance and tested my insulin. And it was extremely elevated. I was a super fit 21 year old and my insulin, I think was sort of 24 or something abnormal. Um, but I've never really uh, had elevated blood glucose. So what we of course seeing is you know there's still this overwhelming focus on blood glucose and cholesterol you know those are the two things that are tested and it's actually still even today quite difficult to get a test for insulin for fasting yeah. insulin and yeah. um, so people aren't being diagnosed they don't know what it is they're not told what it is and they're not warned about it and they don't realize that they have a ticking time bomb in their health markers that no one's picked up on so it's a very interesting place to start is this whole concept of insulin and how it's almost been, um, I want to say, gaslighted mm -hmm. for a very long time. It's very, very important that we talk about insulin, what your insulin levels are and, you know, how that's looking. Probably much more important than glucose to a large extent. Yeah. And like you say, you know, we're still using glucose as our measurement, generally HbA1c. So you know, that's an average over 10 or 12 weeks. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're not even using, you know, fasting glucose or, or, or testing glucose following, um, you know, postprandial glucose following meals. So, so, you know, we have so little information to go on for the patients. They go and see their GP and they're told, oh, you're fine. And they're frustrated and the GPs are frustrated because these people don't feel well, they're gaining weight, they're following the food guidelines, they're doing the best they can to eat um, I mean, what they think is healthy. Yeah. Um, and they end up getting prescribed antidepressants and all sorts of other things. And generally a statin because, you know, their cholesterol, if their cholesterol numbers don't look good, then the GP feels like, oh, I can do something for them. It's like, oh, there's a solution here. Yeah. You know, here, give them I'll a give, pill. Yeah, I'll give them a pill. I'll give them an antidepressant. I'll give them some sleep medication. Um, and like you said in the beginning, so many underlying chronic conditions are a result of normal blood sugars with elevated insulin. And I think the tragedy with that is that what happens is people find their way, a very long-winded way around back to, eventually back to insulin resistance. But it can take them kind of very far to either, you know, near death or extreme severe disease before they get there. So there's that sort of, okay, well, you've got depression and you've got hypercholesterolemia or whatever it may be, or you've got hypertension, and then they start on that medication. And then the next thing happens, which we now know to be, all of the same symptomatic applications of insulin resistance and metabolic disease. So they present in different people in different ways. And they go on these round robin kind of health crises for decades. Mm. I mean, so we've got a, you know, one of our members at the Nutrition Network was on 26 chronic medications. Wow. before she actually got to the root of her problem, which was that she had, was severely insulin resistant and she's now on zero medications. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, 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 she could have kept going until death, which is what she was very close to. You know, she was on injectable insulin and at a point which we consider, you know, a, a very, very serious health crisis where she's, her outlook is probably under five years to the point now where she has a normal outlook on life. And, and a great example of that as well is Tim Noakes, you know, he, his father, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at the exact same age that his father was. And his father died just almost 10 years later with the most terrible death. I mean, like the typical terrible diabetes.
diabetes death where just organ failure everything went wrong from you know from diagnosis until that point so his quality of life was zero for those last 10 years of his life tim noakes was diagnosed at the same age and he is now i think we're 15 years later probably one of the healthiest people i know for his age i mean he really is an extraordinary healthy i mean metabolically you know looking at his actual blood markers to his general lifestyle and his fitness are exemplary extraordinary and give him um the ground to live a very very healthy long happy life you know so so we it's just a tragedy of our times that even a man like tim noakes had to go through actually diagnosis and you know severe he was he was quite severely diabetic by the time he was actually diagnosed but it took 50 years and 50 years ago 50 odd years ago he was actually tested which is very rare he was actually tested for his insulin and it was abnormally high um but back then no one knew what that meant and didn't really focus on it you know it's like the, it's yeah. it's uh, yeah, and none of it and it, i think what's important is not to blame anyone you know there's a part especially when a lot of patients and and also a lot of doctors come into the low carb or the ketogenic movement and suddenly the, the it's like they suddenly see things for what they are for the first time and they become firstly very angry that you know patients that have lost family that have lost limbs lost lives um have struggled for the entire adult lives in a lot of cases suddenly become very angry a eh? and i'm talking about myself as well here because i was very angry for a long time i was angry at every doctor that i felt it almost like mistreated me you know i'd gone to so many healthcare professionals over the decades that i'd struggled with my weight my health my various other symptoms that came up as you know as part of the metabolic disease worsening and they were you know doing their best they were giving me what they they thought would help which was whatever it was at the time it was the low GI list so off I went with my little list and I stuck it in my fridge and I never ate sugar again but wow I was loading my teas with fructose powder instead you know I ended up with fatty liver disease because of it five years five ten years later so on we go and we can be very angry and that's a healthy emotion because then we go, okay, well, what am I going to do with this information? And how am I going to change? How am I going to change myself? Of course, that's the first thing. How am I going to get healthy and look at my immediate environment and get my make sure my children aren't on the worst trajectory than I've been on? And then how am I going to change the, the environment around me? You know, and that's pretty much where certainly Eat Better South Africa, which is our charitable work that we do in South Africa in local communities and then from that where the nutrition network came from which was okay well we need to create a, a healthcare system that actually has healthy ways of applying nutritional treatment for disease mm. um, and and doctors need to train doctors need to understand this they need to be confident with the knowledge that they have and at the point five ten years ago they weren't confident there was a lack of confidence there was a lack of knowledge not always a lack of knowledge so there were people I mean like you're a great example you've been doing this work you said since 1998 you've had the knowledge um, but were you confident were you stepping out shouting it sh waving it from the rooftops making sure that everyone had an insulin resistance you know mark knew what their insulin fasting insulin was well, no I doctors tried. weren't i tried so were in the closet. <laughs> down you know you're just told that you're crazy and you don't know what you're talking about and you're irresponsible yeah. and um you know and and that and that still happens today and that's part of the reason for this podcast is to just try and bring all the people out there who are doing this wonderful work who who have the science and to provide the evidence so that that can get shared yeah beautiful thank you for that so I mean it's just reminded me of how so I lived in England for 10 years and I went there after this diagnosis that I'd had of insulin resistance and I was at that point dabbling with metformin because that was one of the treat early early treatments that we're talking in like 2000 um and I would go to my local NHS doctor and have the discussion every time and, and ask for a prescription for, for metformin and they would say no. And then I'd come back to South Africa when I came on holiday and buy kind of 12 months worth of the metformin tablets and take them with me. And then 12 months later, I would try and have the conversation again, you know, and say, this is the story. I have insulin resistance. And of course they would test my blood glucose and it was normal. And they'd say, no, you're absolutely fine. You need to go on a diet, you know, you, like try and lose some weight. The usual, try and lose some weight. See if you can look at your cholesterol on we went like it was and and in my understanding of course now 
thank heavens, finally, we have got the NHS to the point where we've got incredible doctors like David Unwin and people who are game changers in there, but it hasn't changed enough quickly enough with the knowledge and the evidence that we have. So what medicine is going to have to do to, to actually be able to afford to treat patients into the next 10 to 20 years is change the approach mm. fast to plug the leakage of the crisis that's happening with diabetes in particular and with obesity in the world, in, in the Western world I'm talking about. So unless something changes quickly, and we're seeing this in North America, I mean, it's unsustainable the way that the health crisis is escalating relative to the medications that are being developed and the cost of them to try and counter the crisis. Um, there's this kind of tipping point that's that's already probably long been tipped but we're now seeing it very visually and it's very very disturbing and scary and well, we have to do something as a medical community and as a healthcare well, community as a whole world really you know then it, we have a major health crisis in New Zealand where you know our health system isn't coping our GPs are overworked we don't have enough of them they can't get staff um you know so it's easy to be critical of them, but, you know, they're in an untenable situation in, in many ways. And then we have this huge push for more and more and more diabetes drugs. And I often comment, what would people do if we didn't have diabetes drugs? How would they manage their type 2 diabetes? Would they just go away and die? Or would they change their nutrition and lifestyle habits in order to save their lives. Well, that's the reality. And I mean, certainly in South Africa, we don't have very, you know, if, I don't want to say very functional, but not everyone in our country gets access to sufficient health care to even be diagnosed necessarily. So, I mean, I'm uh, somebody quite close to me as somebody that worked for me. Her nephew died at the age of 26 of undiagnosed type 1 diabetes. So he went blind and went into renal failure and died before anyone actually tested his blood sugar. So he got to that end point within days, was passed away. And those are sort of, you know, in the Western world, we see those as very easily treatable conditions that would be picked up very early in childhood or as soon as the, you know, the, the, the illness presented itself. But we're not seeing that. So in the third world and in developing countries, it's much more in your face. So we're seeing, you know, people drop, women in their 40s drop down dead on the street with a heart attack which is a visible you know metabolic disease death you could say it's not really about the heart attack but of course it goes down in the records as a natural death heart attack it's not really we're not getting to the root of the problem so our work as a community um, and I say our because I see you and I, I, all of us are on the same journey is to really move away from that and to start to empower doctors and patients to just simply take back their own health and kind of claw it back from pharmaceutical drugs um, and back into the fridge ultimately you know it's like what's going on in your fridge and in your cupboard in your home and how are you going to work towards living a better life and living a healthier life and that that brings us to a really interesting point which is the food that we have available and you know, we, you know, we're going into a worldwide recession, the cost of living, inflation in New Zealand is skyrocketing. I was just talking with a friend today about the cost of buying food. Um, you know, it's increased dramatically for me who lives by myself. I can't even imagine what it must be like to, you know, mm. have a family that you're trying to feed. And I imagine mm. that this is happening in South Africa and some of these less Definitely. well off communities so mm -hmm. how has the food changed there you know what kind of what sort of yeah changes have there been over the last you know 50 70 100 years so we're seeing the same story everywhere in the world, which is that basically, you know, it started, of course, at the time, you know, Ansel Keys, a lot of people point fingers at Ansel Keys in that particular study, but that is when things shifted. And that is when um, naturally fatty foods and pro higher protein based foods were replaced with carbohydrates and filler foods. And that shift started to happen on a deep agricultural level. So here in South Africa, most of our crops are 
refined, you know, they are wheat and maize is our sort of key drivers, then soybeans. And then we have a massive, massive, cano massive canola and vegetable oil industry here. And that's what drives what people eat in this country. Um, we also see people here have a very, very particular attachment to what is called pup, um, which is maize meal, very, very highly refined, bleached, whitened maize meal. Um, and the indigenous people of South Africa have been brainwashed by a couple of companies in the country to believe that it's a traditional food, which of course it isn't. I mean, it came with the colonial, you know, it came with the Portuguese colonists because it was a hardy thing to plant to feed animals at the time um, and is now kind of the dominant food source for a large percentage of our population. So it used to be the case that there was a more balanced bowl of pup and now it's mostly just pup. So actually what children tend to eat is just a bowl of white sugar or, you know, white refined, highly refined carbohydrates. And we're seeing that throughout the system now. So adults are eating that same kind of diet, um, which is, of course, the same story that we're seeing everywhere in the world. It's highly refined vegetable oils and, you know, hugely processed foods. And then there's also the other side of it, which is the sort of very, very cheap imported um, chips and sweets and long life goods that come from China. So those are the other things that are kind of doubling off with it. So two minute noodles is if you live in an, in a township where there is no refrigeration and no cooking facilities, which is how a lot of people in townships live, you just need a boil. You just need basically a cup of boiling water, which can come from a kettle or a little gas stove. And you can make your children a meal, which is two minute noodles with that. And it's very cheap. It's five rand, which is about uh, 30 US cents. Right. For a pack of tuna noodles here. So there are ways that people are living with very little to nothing. And we have added to that, we have a power crisis in South Africa, which means that we have up to eight hours of no electricity per day. So people are, that's affected the agriculture system. So we're expecting food prices to just keep skyrocketing. But what we know as through the journey we've done with Eat Better South Africa is, and you may know this as well, is that there are actually very, very affordable ways to eat healthily. It takes a bit of extra work. It takes a bit of creativity. Um, it's not always perfect. So you can't do a perfect ketogenic diet on under two US dollars a day, but you can eat a very low carb and very healthy diet. Um, you know, eggs are quite affordable. There's a lot of foods that in, certainly in South Africa, and I think it's the same everywhere in the world that are actually quite cheap and affordable. It takes education, it takes commitment, it takes knowledge, and it takes an understanding of how important this is and how, you know, the, the ripple effect of eating junk food from very early on plays out later in life. Yeah. So a lot of the work that we do, certainly on the ground here in, in, in our programs, are around just getting teachers and parents to understand, like, why two minute noodles are malnutrition you know and why they why a bowl of maize is not really a sustainable diet for a child and how ultimately we're not seeing our children um finish school successfully because of lack of you know it obviously if a child's brain doesn't develop with the correct nutrition it's it immediately puts them in a position where they're not going to be able to make it through to secondary or tertiary education successfully into life so it's we, we're looking at the future and we're saying, OK, well, what are we going to do in the next 20 to 40 years to make sure that our next generation actually A, survives and B, kind of, you know, makes it into functional um, human beings that can live and sustain themselves in a healthy way? And, you know, and we're seeing that through pregnancy, too, aren't we? So we're seeing, you know, mums and dads, you know, who are, who are creating this child who are not healthy. Um, and then mums are sort of passing on that poor health, you know, and we've seen quite a lot of research about, you know, how that can affect down to as far as two generations. Mm -hmm. And then the mental health, I mean, we have an absolute mental health crisis over here, and I'm sure, again, that that's reflected everywhere and not just in New Zealand. Definitely. And what's really, I mean, particularly interesting and 
and important is, you know, so South Africa is a great example of many things. It sort of tends to be a mirror of a lot of the sort of challenges in the world. Um, also, a lot of innovations come from here because of it. We have this polarity. So we have the highest Gini coefficient in the world, which means that we have the biggest disparity between rich and poor. So, and you see this very visually here, you, you know, you drive past mansions and right just close to them are townships. So there's this extreme polarity and, and the, the amazing great leveler is diabetes because it is the same across it's not a disease of the rich or poor you know it, it's the the diet problem is the same whether you are eating expensive organic vegan products or whether you're just eating mealy pup we see the actual health implications being the same over the long run mm. so it's it's a cross cutter it's a it's a great leveler we're all in this together you know it's not a guaranteed that if you have unlimited access to resources if you have your own farm if you can buy everything that you want from the most perfect grass-fed organic beef every day or have your own private chef you ask your outlook is the same if you're not getting your macros and eating the correct way mm -hmm. and that's what we are meant to be eating and what we've been eating for thousands of years that's gone very very wrong in the last 50 years so aren't we lucky that we're starting to know this now and that we can change it, but we have a huge amount of work to do. And medicine has a huge amount of change that it has to go through in the next couple of decades. So we're hoping to be a big part of that. Um, obviously, this textbook that we're taking out into the world in the next month or so is a key aspect of the many pieces of the puzzle, which is just to, so that there's an actual medical textbook that sits on the shelves with the Merck manual. Um, which is what doctors currently do is they go, oh, gosh, you know, oh, my goodness, your, your cholesterol's high open. Let's quickly get to hypercholesterolemia or, you know, elevated cholesterol in the Merck manual and see how it maps to a medication so that your patient leaves with a script and goes and gets their pills or in South Africa in the clinics, people call them their party packs um, and they leave feeling like, OK, this is going to make me better, this drug this one thing, this, or 10 in many cases. And as we know, that's not what happens. You know, that's, that's usually the pathway to worse health. That's the, that's the first step to becoming over-medicated. And I think it's really interesting if we touch back on Professor Noakes and the story that you shared about him, because you know, when I was studying and studying exercise physiology, Professor Noakes was the guru, you know, he was, you know, he's a world renowned for his work. And, you know, the marathons that he ran, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, he wrote the law of running and um, was a phenomenal exercise physiologist. So, you know, it was a bit of a shock to hear that someone with that reputation with that degree of knowledge got type 2 diabetes which is a lifestyle disease exactly and he's a perfect example of how um it's not about laziness you know he he had run 17 comrades marathons he has been probably the fittest and most embodied just, he, I would say he's the most disciplined person I've ever known. And I can honestly say that because I've really, I've worked with him. This is the ninth year now that I've worked closely with him and he doesn't cheat. <laughs> and he thinks that everyone has that disciplinary, you know, and I keep saying to him, listen, no, I, I understand that you can do this in the way that you did it, which was he never, he literally, he read one book, which was the new Atkins revolution. He got rid of all the carbs. He ne And I don't think honestly, he's ever really eaten carbohydrates again since. And of course, the rest of the world, there's a scale, you know, so we, not everyone has the discipline, not everyone has the knowledge and the ability to actually apply that and to overcome their habits and their compulsions or addictions or whatever you'd like to call them in such an articulate and powerful way. So he's an amazing example of a human who is just so deeply embodied and so disciplined. And then we've got everyone else from there out, you know, there's the scale. <laughs> And, I think, and we have to work with that. We have to work with the realities of people's abilities to change. Yeah, and I'd like to talk about that in a minute. But I was just going to say one more thing about Professor Noakes was that it wasn't like he was eating a junk food diet either when he got type 2. Oh, he was on I mean, dietary guidelines. And, you know, so often we hear 
the excuse from the naysayers about, you know, this carbohydrate restriction that, oh, it's not about the carbs. It's they're not following the dietary guidelines. They're not doing it properly. They're not, you know, they're not trying hard enough. They're just eating chocolate and ice cream. And, you know, Professor Noakes is an example. Um, Dr. Bino from the US, who I, you know, talk to a lot. He just says over and over again, I, he said, I adhered to the guidelines and I yes. got fat and sick. Yes, yes. And that's a very, very difficult conversation to have. You know, it's very difficult to accept that and to actually really, really absorb that and to understand that the calories in, calories out model has been flawed. And we've all been working towards that for 50 years. And now it's time to really change that and to start to treat chronic disease obesity in particular in a different way and the evidence is there um you know we the, the, it's so overwhelming in fact the evidence that it can't be ignored and it can't be set aside and it can't be gaslighted anymore mm. so it's a great time to be um i would say diagnosed with a chronic disease <laughs> Because yeah. 10, 15 years ago when I was, it was a disaster that led me down a terrible track that I'm still recovering from. You know, it's it's like you, I kept going. I kept going further and further into the very, very heavy plant-based, you know, no refined carb diet that led me just worse and worse down the metabolic disease journey. And it really got very bad at one point in my life. I, I actually quit my job and started dancing full time. That was when I was probably the most obese I've ever been in my life. I was dancing for 10 hours a day and eating nearly nothing. Um, and it just, it was like, <laughs> you know, it's like being a hamster in a wheel where you're told that you're meant to be doing something. So you keep doing it, which is what I've heard from so many people who have struggled, particularly with obesity or with weight or with any of these conditions is they just keep going you know, be, doing what they're being told, trying harder and getting sicker. Well, you know, it's really interesting because I was just listening to, I was, I was on a New York Times interview shared by, um, oh, I've forgotten which doctor, but one of the um, US doctors. And, you know, I, I really like her work. And so I, I had a look at this piece that she was sharing and I started listening to this interview. And so the woman speaking was an obesity medicine expert, and she's really one of the people pushing for the use of these diabetes drugs to manage um, obesity, which is, you know, where we're going now. It's where New Zealand's going. We're now recommending these for obese 12 year olds and 14 year olds, which I won't get started on because that'll get me going. Um, and, but I was listening to her, and she was talking about. Um, one of the patients that she had and how the interventions work and this will bring us back into this whole mindset part so they intervened with a with the dietary guideline diet and that worked but then as soon as the woman went back to sort of like free living without without the contact and without the support things went haywire again and the doctor had bumped into her in the supermarket and was sort of looking in her trolley and the woman said to her see I eat everything that you tell me I'm doing what you tell me and it's not working and so she said so this is the reason why we need to have these drugs rather than looking at what the information is this that has been given out very, very difficult. And we can't expect everyone to be a health detective like you and I are. You know, that's the reality is that actually most people do trust. And that's, I mean, I know this, we all know it. Most people trust what their doctors and their healthcare workers tell them. So mm -hmm. we have a domestic worker who is she's very far down the line of hypertensive, you know, disease, you know, she's really metabolic disease. So she's very severely obese, severely hypertensive on three different blood pressure medications, will not give up the carbs. But 23 years ago, when she was diagnosed with her hypertension, the nurse at the clinic told her, 
that she can have sugar as long as it's brown sugar because that's healthy. So to this day, she she still puts four brown sugars into her tea. And, and that's because the nurse told her, you know, that's it. People believe and deeply trust medicine um, or they have for a very long time. And this is where medicine is coming into such a crisis is because people and patients are starting to rebel. They're mm. not trusting their doctors anymore. And doctors are losing confidence in their own abilities to actually help patients. You know, and there's, I mean, I'm going to mention his name because he's such an amazing guy and you won't mind, but Dr. Andrew Oswari, who's part of our network and he's done our advanced certification. He, I mean, he only explored low carb because one of his patients lost I think 26 kilos and reversed their diabetes and and it, they ignored his advice and he kind of went like geez I'm gonna have to now do a little bit of research and then he did the same thing and reversed you know did what his patient told him to do reversed his type 2 diabetes lost huge amounts of weight and changed his life and then of course changed his practice when yeah. he realized that he'd been wrong for all this time but the shame that the doctors and the healthcare workers are feeling around the fact that their patients are educating them is it's not fair you know I mean they've done their however many millions of years it takes to actually become a physician and then to specialize and then the Im immense amount of commitment and love that's gone into your medical journey as a doctor or a physician mm -hmm. to be failing your patients is the most immense sense of loss and that's why we see such high suicide levels and such high mental health crises in the medical sector is because doctors have lost you know I don't want to say lost their way but they've lost their trust and they've, they've lost trust in their own ability to actually help people mm -hmm. and that's just because they've fallen so heavily into the the direction that the pharmaceutical industry has taken them on as practitioners and there's not, there isn't a very easy way out. No. Um, they're aware of. But what we have presented, certainly through this particular textbook, I believe, is a very, very compelling case and a, and a very clear way out. Yeah. Um, it, it's a way out of medication. And that's not to say, and I really want to say this, it's not to say that there's anything wrong with using allopathic medication to support your health. I mean, it's, you know, we don't want to say like drop everything, get off every single medication you've ever been on, do it. You know, if you want to come off medication, you can come off medication, absolutely. You know, I think most medications are, it's now known that there are lifestyle measures that you can take. But if you can't take those, it doesn't mean that you have to stay on the medication path only for the rest of your life. You know, you need to find a bridge, of course, between the two. And and we're seeing this now. I mean, I'm seeing all this news about this diabetes drug as MPEC that's out of stock because, you know, Elon Musk lost weight on it and now it's fashionable, whatever the reasons are. It's like you cannot rely on the fact that with the current global changing dynamics that you're always going to be able to access your medication just mm -hmm. because you're in the first world you know south africans know this all too well they a lot of people don't even get medication um but it, just because you're in england and now you're struggling to get pain medication because of the crisis at the nhs it's a good time to realize that you have to take control of your health yeah. and that comes from the fridge and the the thoughts that you think and the way that you live your life that's where we start mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just reiterate you know um that the book is full of the science and, you know, we have the science for so many areas of health now. So, you know, not only metabolic health, um, hormonal health, but cancer, mm. cardiovascular disease. I did Georgia, Georgia Eads training this time last year in, um, in ketogenic diets for, you know, kind of neurological health conditions and I mean it's huge in that it's been used in epilepsy forever for for a very very long time and you know we're seeing the improvements in Alzheimer's and um, Parkinson's mm -hmm. so you know there's so many areas of health where it's it's probably one of a number of tools that can be used but it's a very very important tool well, I think what we've also seen or we, what we're seeing is, you know, there's been this huge polarity or or polarization is maybe the word that's happened in medicine where there's just you've gone from one specialist to the other. So you've gone from your endocrinologist who's giving you a set of pills and then you've gone on to the neurologist with those symptoms, you know, then you, off you go to the dietitian. And actually, these are a lot of these things are treating the same condition. And we know that we now know that mental health is 
connected and directly associated with metabolic health. Our brains determine our bodies and our bodies are connected to our brains. So these are not separate things. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely. A neurologist is going to be able to help you with a very specialized condition, but you've got to be looking at your metabolic health. If you've got any problems with your neurological system or with your mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we cover in the book is what we've done is we've taken a very, very broad view of, you know, the, the nutritional aspects of disease. Yeah. And what causes disease ultimately? What causes a failure in the body, which is a perfectly healthy, homeostatic, self-regulating system? Mm -hmm. How do we lead it up with our behavioral choices into disease? Mm -hmm. Or disease? And then and that applies to, you know, we go through the different sections, of course. The, the, this applies to the endocrine system, to the cardiovascular system, to the neurological system. It applies to the present in the muscul musculoskeletal system is a big one as well, you know, the and chronic the pain. Reproduction. Aging. System. yes reproductive then we look at chapter eight is gastrointestinal so you know so there's there's a mat every system in the body is connected and it's associated with your metabolic health um so we can start to go well is aging or is the understanding that we're going to have musculoskeletal problems um stiffness pain and aging symptoms actually guaranteed or is that just an you know a, a false set of beliefs that comes from poor health and, is and it necessary you know, get told as well you know while well, you're getting older so what do you expect of course you're yes. going to be tired of course you're going to gain weight of course you're not going to be as fit as you were um of course well, why you know, of course you're going to get arthritis of course you're going to get osteoarthritis um you know all of these things well actually are you and do you have to get those things and is it genetic well, genetics is a very interesting area because we adopt and inherit the behavior and lifestyle choices of our parents and their ancestors, and we inherit the genes as well. So they, their choices, as you said, for the last three generations or more are actually living in our cells. Mm -hmm. So we can choose a different genetic path if we would like to. And we don't have to accept that we have, we are going to get type 2 diabetes because all of our parents had it, uh, or obesity because you know, that's in our genes. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it doesn't need to be anymore. Very few genes um, predict an absolute genetic pathway. Most genes are modifiable by nutrition and lifestyle factors. So, yeah. Um, so the message is one of empowerment. It's actually that there is a different way. There is a different way to, to look at health and to treat disease and to move through your life in a way that's more empowering. And of course, this is uh, this is underpinned by immense science and immense reference and immense rigorous research that's gone on in the background, thanks to our community that's worked in metabolic health for these years. So there is enough evidence now to really say, okay, well, we need to be looking at a carbohydrate restricted diet ultimately or what that's the premise of the book as the treatment for insulin resistance and that is a panacea solution for many many people i'm not going to say it's for everyone but it's for many people that are diseased and you know that you and i know that so so let's talk about how let's talk about mindset let's talk about the struggles the the emotional the mental struggles the thoughts and the feelings that people have about this the the struggle to give up those foods that they're so familiar with the beliefs mm -hmm. about I have to eat this way because of the cost of food I have to eat this way because this is the only food my children will eat or my husband will eat um you know there's there for every person there's a different set of beliefs and ration, um, rationale as to why it's too hard to do yes and there's also I mean I think the thing in working in working with food and with diet is it's the most emotional it's our first point of reference it's mm. our first point of comfort so there's the addictive or you know kind of self-soothing aspect of well, I mean, I think when we're born, the first thing we do is we put on the breast and we're in that close connection with our mothers. I mean, of course, we're going to be addicted to that that, yes. that sense of um, comfort and support and, you know, emotional kind of connection for the rest of our lives. 
Absolutely. And, and what's so important to know about that is that it's, it's a universal human thing. Mm. But, and this is the work that Dr. Laurie Rauch, who writes one of the chapters in the textbook, has done a lot of research on, is, of course, the understanding that we are the only mammals on Earth that eat when we have an activated sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. So no other mammals eat when they are under distress or anxiety or any kind of panic or threat. Human beings are the only ones that do that. And of course, the way that we eat our food and how we eat our food affects the way that it's digested and absorbed and received by the body. I mean, that's that's scientifically underpinned, but it's also just what we know. So mm -hmm. if we are, and what we're seeing now and what we're knowing is that association between trauma and disease and trauma and obesity or trauma and overeating or addictive eating, I guess you could call it, is associated with the way that people eat and comfort and emotional eating. Mm -hmm. So those are things that have to be looked at. They can't be ignored. Um, you you know, that it's, it's part of who we are as humans. But also just on the broader topic of food choices, it's a very difficult area. You know, so food is, has religious um associations there are a lot of cultures that are told what they can and can't eat um it has uh, every kind of eth ethical and ideological application attached to it whether it's the green movement or the carnival movement or everything in between um their food groups that every kind of food group that you look at and every food item has a piece of research attached to it that says that it's bad for you and one that you could probably find that says that it's good for you and when we're confronted with that and this is where the media is a little bit to blame or that plays very heavily into this we confronted with these like sensational headlines all the time about food and diet and health and it's very very confusing for the average person they see that one study that is a huge focus puller so like the women's health study which looked at um, women's health and diet over a long period of time in America as an example of that there are those kind of big studies like the China study that came out that said that eating red meat was bad for you. Uh, they, they're taken out of context. They, they're always usually debunked at some point. Um, there's always the two sides to them. It's immensely confusing and confusing. And I went to a stage where I got super into the research and was like determined to find the ideal diet for myself. And the one that was the most aligned. And it got to the point, I mean, I went very far where I was kind of eating like broccoli and organic veg and extra virgin olive oil and eggs and nothing really else you know it was like I took it very far and then I was sure that this was like I'd finally found the like per the only things that were agreed in science and of course what happened was I got quite ill actually and had to change and keep looking and keep searching and th th there's a huge amount of complexity in the food arena so we have to know that when we make our food choices and then to add to that once we know all of these things and we may even have our grocery list we then go into the modern vegas that is the current modern grocery store yeah yeah and we have to actually walk through there and make sensible food choices with our children you know it's like the the chaos that goes on with in-store marketing and shopping marketing is a whole next level of Look, um, you're, a, you're a marketer you know exactly what's going on behind the scenes absolutely yeah. Absolutely. And, and what's so amazing, which most people don't know, is that, you know, I mean, marketers know exactly what you look at. We use eye tracking devices so that we know what people actually, how their eyes work as they walk into a store and how their decision making works to such a nuanced level mm -hmm. that we can almost guarantee we will send you out of the shop with what we want you yeah. to buy, not what you think is or know is healthy or what you actually want to feed your children. And, and so then, you know, even then people are still trying to make the best decisions. You know, the packets have um, superfood on them. They have vitamins and minerals on them, um, high in protein on them. And, you know, without a nutrition science degree, it's very hard to actually determine, determine what is actually in them. Um, right. nothing, yeah. nothing like and what they're proclaiming. And that's, I mean, certainly in South Africa, I think it's a little bit more structured in New Zealand, but here there isn't much moderation and control around health property marketing. So you can say high protein um, and there's no one actually making sure that it is a high protein food. Um, nutritional labels are not regulated and very, very carefully analyzed. They're not understood by the consumers. So actually it's pretty much within reason. You can actually say whatever you want. <laughs> 
on a you know and package things in whatever way you feel like it and there's very little recourse and control around that Mm -hmm. and that's I mean that's something I wrote my thesis on was around marketing to children in particular because that's a whole other area which is just being Mm -hmm. completely taken over where children are dictating what goes into the grocery basket instead of mothers and adults based on marketing I see that I see that with my own grandchildren have quite um, determined opinions of I should be eating and you know we have an ad which I saw um, for one of the supermarkets where a child goes you know I'm vegan and 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 sort of demands that that um, the family become vegan and it's absolutely appalling you know Um, I don't I don't know whether it reaches any marketing standards but I, I think it's breaches some moral and ethical standards myself but it absolutely does and it's it's I mean I call it greenwashing because it is ultimately and I'm I when I was 13 I something happened I saw a pig falling out of a truck in a car park and I decided I was vegetarian and that was it and for 17 years I did not eat meat Mm -hmm. um, which was I believe one of the actual drivers of my early onset metabolic disease was I went very far into the green green smoothie health fanatic you know I thought I was the healthiest person on the block buying everything organic and whole grain and all of that but I was not eating protein and I wasn't developing in the right way metabolically because of it I was doing early inordinate amounts of sports and exercise and suffering like fainting and having health challenges early on that were related to the way that I was eating for sure and that was it, you know, it's like a lot of, it's particularly in teenage girls, they reach a certain age where they become very, very aware of the environmental crisis, you know, it's the Greta Thunberg generation. And this stuff is important because it does matter, you know, and people care a lot about the environment. So these associations that are coming in um, around animals and environment and health, and the implications of a food group to the environment, the application of that, that has a huge impact on food choices. Mm. And the environmental movement has a huge impact on food choices. And we can't ignore it. I mean, of course, we are all interested in living in a world where, that is sustainable and that survives. But we also have to look a little bit closer in and make sure that we are eating a diet that's sustainable so that we survive. Mm. and these things aren't exclusive you know they, they're unfortunately deeply connected the food systems are very very damaged and it's very difficult to get the right information and and perhaps no one even has it entirely so what do we do we come back to the science we come back to the metabolic truths and that's not always convenient so for me it would be lovely and convenient if I could eat a lovely green smoothie and fruit and veg diet and stay vegetarian and stay on that path that I was on because it's what I ideologically identify with yeah unfortunately that's not what my body needs <laughs> and, and you know I can relate to that and it's it's challenging um you know I have a friend who's very sensitive about animal welfare um she's vegetarian gets very 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 upset about you know animals animals being slaughtered for food and things like that and I can really, like, on, at an emotional level, I can really um, connect with her feelings. And yet, you know, I was talking to her yesterday and I said, well, I eat meat, but I'm grateful for the meat. Mm-hmm. And I want the meat to be processed. I won't, you know, I, I, I try not to eat chicken. I try not to eat pork because I do not like the way the animals are treated and, and farmed. Um and you know try and buy you know free range eggs and things like that so you know you pay a little bit more for it but at least you feel like you're doing something to support a better a better industry Mm, absolutely but you know even when we it, it doesn't matter what you eat whether you are eating a vegan diet animals are dying so that you can be fed and you know that's something that's not really um Absolutely. It's a very difficult, very easy. Yeah. Very, very difficult. And this is all connected to the emotions and the behavioral decisions that we make around food. And they are complicated. But what we have to remember is that we've come from a history where we've had food shortages and where we haven't had the privilege of the cho- overwhelming choice and convenience that we have today and you know and there are a lot of people living in this world that don't have choices that we have in the western world and that are eating what they can get 
Yeah. Um, and and that's you know where the sort of non-judgment philosophy I guess has to come in is to go and we've learned that over the years of going into underserved and township communities in South Africa is in the early days we went in with this kind of position about what you know a ketogenic diet and a more banting diet being the solution for health um, and then having learned and met people over the years that are making choices that they can and that are surviving. And a big thing that happened for us was when we went to, you know, our state, our central state, um, it's called the Department of Health here, which is like, you know, your NHS kind of story here. And we've eventually got to present to the head of a wonderful man who's a medical doctor. And he, he basically said, you know, I agree with you guys. And this is what we should be doing. But we're struggling to get clean water and stale bread to some children in this country. That is the reality that we're working with. And what you're doing is just so far removed from it. And, and that was a huge eye-opener, for certainly for me and for us, is like to have more compassion for politicians, for decision makers, uh, to understand that they are actually a lot of the time just doing the best that they can. They're not there like kind of rage against the machine, um, trying to necessarily change the world order. Although a lot of my colleagues think that they are, and maybe they are somewhere in some aspects of it. But having sat as a brand manager at a marketing desk, I know for sure that, you know, there are a lot of moms and people like you and I that are there doing a good job, doing good work, doing, um, you know, trying their best to make the best, best of their bread brand that they're tasked with overseeing for the next few years. You know, it's, it, these things are endemic to society and people choose the things that taste nice and that they want. So the market does also reflect people's demand. So yeah. if a big manufacturer puts a great low carb bread out there for three months and loses money for three months and has to deal with off stock, they are not going to keep making it. They're going to keep making the white bread. Yeah. So as consumers, what do we have to do? We have to change that obviously by, with our purse power and actually buy the things that are healthy. And we have to also be compassionate and work with what we've got. And it's not always easy. And I believe the plant-based burgers are having a bit of a fail on the market. They had a huge, huge success. And I believe that sales are really dropping down. So, you know, that might be another situation where um, a re-evaluation of, of the market will take place. Um, it will. I mean, I think the market is the cost because it costs as much or more than buying a big burger. Yeah. I mean, a couple of times, you know, this Beyond Meat or whatever it's called is came to South Africa. And a couple of times I was like, gosh, I'd really like to try this. But it's three times the price of a 100% beef burger, like, <laughs> which I know it's a highly processed food, so I'm not going to buy it. And I wonder if the rest of the country has managed to afford to do that or has chosen that, you know. And, and we are very, very um, flexible and price sensitive. Uh, you know as consumers so we can move and we can change quickly you know and you know those people that you're talking about I mean your heart just goes out as you speak you know you can just feel so much empathy for them and it's such a challenging challenging situation to be in very very challenging and also difficult you know when you work with sort of people that have lived very hard lives and then you're going we all know how difficult it is to give up carbs and to give up sugars and to change our diet it's hard it takes like really you so you know it depends on the person but I know for myself it's a daily practice of really staying on path and not falling into the kind of convenience eating processed food story because it's just so easy so to and and that's with all the resources that I have and all the work that I've done in my life but so to go to somebody who just has been through immense lifelong trauma and is living in a township and has nearly no income and yeah. then to try and tell them that they must make this major revolutionary diet for change um it's it's incredible and I say that because I have the most immense respect for the women that I've met on the journey that have done this and they do do it and they do change their lives with immense courage but it's not easy so yeah I mean I guess my hope is that we we you know we come from a place of strong science and robust evidence-based knowledge and our own personal lived experience but within that there is the range and there's the world which is imperfect that we're working in and living in and working with wow. this is this is fabulous I'd like to we've been we've been going for a wee while so I want to respect your time but I'd like to just 
touch on briefly the myths around ketogenic diets. Can you talk about those? And, you know, cholesterol is an obvious one. Um, I saw a I saw a podcast the other day with a couple of sort of more plant-based doctors analyzing some research and saying, oh, look, this is terrible. You know, your APOB increases and um, kind of putting fear into people who don't really understand sort of the risk, the risk, you know, the, the hazards um, involved in, in all those different markers. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts about the dangers and diet that we constantly um, hear? So, I mean, I think the big one is ketoacidosis is associated with ketogenic eating, you know, and that's, there's this huge fear of going into diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a very, very extremely rare life-threatening medical emergency that, you know, is, is an unrealistic scenario for somebody that's going on to a ketogenic diet. So it's an unfortunate thing that they have the same word, uh, but I would just, if you can try to divorce them in your mind and in the same light, if you can try to divorce fat with being fat, that's another injustice because we don't want to be fat. So we don't want to eat fats and it's an obvious association. But what we do know is that um, triglycerides, which is a marker in the blood that we look at carefully, uh, elevated triglycerides are caused by eating carbohydrates. So blood fats are, are, are a result of carbohydrate intake. So if you can try and divorce dietary fat from being fat and cut that off forever in your minds, that's a really great start. Um, you know, it, it just to don't see them as the same thing. And that being said, of course, fats have higher calories, significantly higher calories than other food groups. So you can, of course, look at, you know, don't, the, one of the big myths is that you're going to go onto a ketogenic diet and drink cream for three weeks and lose weight. Some very fortunate people can do that. But on the most part, what we're just trying to do is get back to natural eating which is just eating real foods again, you know? So don't think that people that eat in eat a low carbohydrate diet binge on fat and butters all the times, you know, it's, that's not quite how it works. So there, there are these bits. And then what we've learned and what I've seen from the research is that people tend to eat less fat over time on a banting or ketogenic diet than they do on a normal diet. So actually what happens is the total caloric consumption comes down. So when people's apostats or appetites are reset, they tend to eat less actually in terms of total calories they also eventually end up eating less fat and in some cases even less protein of course much less carbohydrates so don't think that it's kind of this radical you know like bacon and bacon and butter diet and of course it can be there are the extremes so there are people who do eat those diets and that do well on them and that are healthy on them so there's this kind of negative association and and you can really have a very healthy vibrant um, beautifully micro balanced diet on a ketogenic or banting diet. It's really a gorgeous way to eat. I have to say it's really joyful. Um, and I feel so happy living a life on that. And that, that being said, again, cholesterol is the same story. I mean, I'm, there's so much science out there that I recommend that you read if you want to know about your specific markers, but the main principle here is just not to fall into the fear you know, and it's like there are very few metabolic diseases that are medical emergencies. So absolutely, if you're in like an extreme diabetic emergency and you're hospitalized, you know, or if you have such severe hypertension that you absolutely must go onto a blood pressure medication as a temporary thing, then do it. But also just take things a bit slower, you know, and don't just fall into the panic. Mm -hmm. so, and that's the statin story is the big one. I mean, it's just the number of people over the age of 60 that are on statins. It's almost like everyone, it feels like. And mm -hmm. then they believe they have to stay on them every day for the rest of their lives. And then they have these negative side effects. If something isn't making you feel good and improving your health significantly within the first couple of weeks, it's not probably going to be the right thing for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, medication or diets that work, work for you quite quickly. You feel better. You know, there may be that first stumbling block, which we see with people that go into ketosis, where they have things like the keto flu, and there's that reaction. Um, but beyond that, you need to be feeling good on whatever you're doing. Mm. And I think there's mm. a couple of points there. So one of them is often, I know with my clients, often when I 
Well, I usually, well, it depends on the client, you know, it depends. Some people want to transition straight into it. Some people want to go more slowly. So there's so many individual variations that you can apply. But often one of the ways of overcoming the reduction in food or the change in food is to have that little bit more fat in your diet, which helps speed up, you know, it gives you that energy that you need that you're not getting from the carbohydrates. It helps you switch metabolically to being a fat burner. And then as you say, over time, you start to reduce the amount of added fat. So I think that's can be sometimes where there's a problem because often there's a lot of really yummy ketogenic treats and things like that that are very high fat and high calories. So we still have to be a bit a bit aware yeah, yeah. of the amount of energy that we're eating. And then mm-hmm. and with regard to some of the comments I see on social media and, and here on podcasts about um you know, saturated fat in the liver causes liver disease and saturated fat in the muscle causes insulin resistance. I just want to go back to what you were saying about the conversion of carbohydrates to triglycerides. And our body turns those fats into saturated fat, turns that carbohydrate into saturated fat because that's the safest fat to store in our body. So, of course, it's going to look like we have high saturated fat, but it hasn't come from what we've eaten. Well, it has, but it hasn't come from the fat we've eaten. It's come from the carbohydrates that we've eaten. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, that's, I mean, you can, the cholesterol story is a big one. And I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. And please consult your medical doctor. But of course, you know, what we know, and it comes back to the blame game. We, medicine is like human beings, you know, we operate in the same way. So we see the most obvious thing first, which is obviously at the site of, for example, a heart attack. The cholesterol is there in the artery. And we now understand that the cholesterol is the ambulance that is sent there you know, and that there was a deeper level, which is what was going on in the vessels around the artery and the inflammatory condition and the various conditions that created the problem in the first place, um, which, which, come, you know, and then that's like, oh, here we go. And then we look deeper and we go, okay, well, what's happening in the rest of the body and how's the metabolic health of the person? So it's like peeling an onion mm-hmm. um, and we have to keep peeling. So we have to, for our own health and lives we have to keep peeling and finding those answers and that can change as we go and your diet can change throughout your life your position your belief system can change throughout your life what you eat changes Tim Noakes tore out pages of his own books from 20 years ago because he was the carb burning marathon runner and now he's the fat burning marathon runner and he will keep changing and he will keep evolving throughout his lifetime so so that you know these these things are myths and we have to ask if things are true and and why we're doing them and what they're about just like go a little bit deeper like do i need this pill Mm. is it true (laughs) you Mm. know is it really true Mm. do i you know where does it come from and do i trust the the advice that i've been given can i find alternative points of view and that's the same thing you know i mean it's with everything get a few diagnose goes if you diagnose with something go to a few different people to Mm. get different perspectives and I suggest that you go to somebody who knows metabolic health regardless of the diagnosis because they're going to help you get to the underlying cause of your condition that's probably been there for 20 years and if we could just touch on your own journey and your own strategies you know you just mentioned earlier that you know it's kind of like every day it's a challenge every day it's about making making that choice every day that that's what you're going to do can you talk a little bit about the strategies you use to um keep focused and you know do you ever you know do you ever go off on binges what happens if you do go off on a binge how do you get back to you know sort of an equilibrium so so i i have to have a daily practice that supports me aligning myself with putting my health as a priority in my life Um, and so uh, for me that involves mindfulness it it involves yoga every day being in nature every day and or yoga or movement and exercise because that is the most important thing to just come back into the body 
and not to make heady decisions. Um, so that time in my life where I was eating only eggs and olive oil and broccoli was a pure head related I got so far into the research and into my head that it was like I wasn't even in my body. And my body was kind of desperately calling for other things that I was not giving it. So those are my daily practices. Um, and I set very, very clear intentions for the day. So if I don't, and if I wake up and if the day starts in a chaos and a rush, then I am more likely to make food mistakes with myself and also in the way that I feed my son if I'm not prepared and if I'm not coming from a place of consciousness so that means being slowing down a little bit and it's not always easy to slow down but being whatever the morning and the day starts with for me is what helps me to define my day and to make it a good more likely to stay on track one and then if I go off track like everyone, I'm a human being. And my teacher, Dr. James Gordon, who's a psychiatrist at the School for Mind Body Medicine, he says, you know, it's very much about healthy eating, but there's no like particular diet other than being aware. And if you want that ice cream so badly, then have a teaspoon of the ice cream and absolutely love that tiny teaspoon that you're having and enjoy it. You know, don't have the whole bowl. Mm -hmm. And then go keep going, you know, if that's what you need for that particular time in your life. But in that moment, know why you need the ice cream and what it is about that spoon of ice cream, that's what it's doing. And mm -hmm. going back to what we talked about earlier, you know, we have to start to own our own addictions and stories about food and what we consume and to be aware of them and be conscious of them. And I know for myself that if I cheat or if I do things that are wrong or if I feed my family junk food, it comes from a place that's disconnected and unconscious, not mm -hmm. from a place that's grounded, centered and conscious. So I think mindfulness and stress, working on stress in one's own mindfulness is actually at the core of this. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's really good advice. And I think, you know, have the ability to just laugh at yourself and accept that you've gone off track. Um, if you go off track, enjoy what you're doing. And, you know, I have a few kind of like little slogan things that I use and never miss twice is one of them. So it's like, don't worry about that meal. You've got the next meal. Just focus on, it's what you said, just focus on getting back to it with the next meal. And yes. you know, something else I say to my clients sometimes, they go, oh, you know, I had such a bad week. And I say, well, you know, if you didn't have a shower for a week, you wouldn't go, that's it, I can never shower again. You know, the first thing you would do is get back and have a shower. And so exactly. it's with this, you know, you've been away, you haven't had the food you needed, you've been at a conference or you've been at a wedding or family thing. You know, don't worry about it. Just like go yeah. home, get back on track. Exactly. And and that's and what we know and what science now knows is that stress is one of the biggest causes of all diseases. Yeah. So if you're not eat, if you're eating in a stress state and and if you're not being joyful and enjoying mealtime, which is one of the beautiful gifts in life, mm. then you're not doing yourself a service and you're not in a healthy environment. Mm. And I see that a lot. You know, if your food's beautiful and healthy and fresh, you're going to enjoy it and you're going to feel beautiful and healthy and fresh. And your body's going to receive that beautiful gift, which comes ultimately from the sunlight and live a beautiful life or a healthier life. Well, yeah. I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. I want to say thank you so much to you and all your colleagues for the contribution that you make in this space. You have literally changed the world. Um, you are all so respected you're really science-based and um, the rest of us are learning so much from your work thank you so much Susan it's been an honor and I've really enjoyed chatting to you today yeah. so I just remind everybody um, the book the science of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction in human health and can people is there anywhere that people can touch base with you follow you on social media or linkedin yes absolutely so i'm going to ask my team to send all the links but obviously through the nutrition network and the noakes foundation and eat better south africa is where all of the work that i and we do is in the world and our textbook is available through elsevier international and you can order it online it's it's pre-order it comes out in may in print uh, anywhere in the world so if you would like to have a copy or see, get one for your doctor or get them to buy one yeah. that's a really really good idea I suggest <laughs>
Hey, thank you. It's been wonderful speaking with you.